Hello everyone, my name is Gary O'Mealy, and in this video we are going to talk about nervous tissue. So nervous tissue is going to play a lot of different roles in the homeostasis negative feedback loops that we've talked about in previous videos and in all the different physiological scenarios that we're going to be talking about in the future. So nervous tissue it, uh, serves important roles as sensors and in specific detail uh, a lot of sensors are the nerve endings of sensory neurons and these nerve endings tend to be found in the skin and embedded in other locations in the body basically they tend to be positioned in places that allows them to detect specific stimuli whether it's changes in temperature physical stimuli pressure stimuli we'll see lots of examples of that as we go throughout the semester Clearly, nervous tissue is going to play an important role in control centers. Big collections of neurons that are found in the brain, the spinal cord, and then in the ganglia that are outside the central nervous system, these control centers are going to be receiving sensory information and then outputting efferent signals to tell and orchestrate responses from other effector cells throughout the body to achieve homeostasis. And then as far as the communication that goes between the sensors and the control centers and then the control centers and the effectors, cranial and spinal nerves are big bundles of the axons of these sensory and motor neurons that are sending the afferent and efferent signals back and forth through the negative feedback system. So as far as nervous uh, tissue goes, there are two major types of cells that we are going to find. Number one clearly are the neurons. These are excitable cells that send and receive electrochemical signals throughout the body. In a minute, we will clarify what we mean by the word excitable here. Secondly, you have what are called the glial cells. These are not excitable and they do not send and receive signals in the same way that neurons do, but they do provide a lot of important supporting roles for the neurons. Uh, to kind of help you remember that glial cells serve these support roles, think of glia as being the glue that holds the nervous tissue together because glia is uh, derived from a Greek word that literally means glue. Okay, so let's start by talking about neurons, and we're just providing a gentle introduction in this video. In a future chapter where we actually cover the basics of the nervous system, we will go through this in more exquisite detail. So neurons are specialized cells in the body that are excitable. Like I said, we need to talk about what excitable means. So the first thing to understand is that pretty much every cell in the body has something called a membrane potential. Neurons are part of a select group of cells that are capable of changing their membrane potential in response to various stimuli, like the stimuli that we talk about in homeostasis loops. Okay, what is the membrane potential? The membrane potential is a quantification of the difference in electrical charges across the cell membrane. The idea here, of course, is that of all the electrolytes and ions that we find in our different bodily fluids, some of them are positively charged like sodium, potassium, and calcium, while others are negatively charged like chloride and bicarbonate. So we've already seen that there is, elect, uh, there is chemical disequilibrium across the cell membrane. You find a lot more sodium outside the cell. You find a lot more potassium in the cell. It's just natural that if you add up all the electrical charges together, you're going to end up with an inequality across the cell membrane. So the fact that every cell has a membrane potential tells you that one side of the membrane is more positive than the other. One side is more negative than the other other in terms of total electrical charge. So what a neuron is going to do is produce action potentials, which are waves of the movement of ions that move down the length of the axon and serves as basically a current that carries the message down the axon. But the deal here is that a neuron will only fire off these action potentials when the membrane potential changes and changes sufficiently. So we'll cover the basics of membrane potential quantification and how that changes in future videos. But for now, consider that 
a neuron when it is in an unstimulated state and it's not doing anything, it maintains a resting membrane potential of negative 70 millivolts. There's going to be a time this semester where it's going to be really important that you remember that number, but today is not that day, so don't worry about it just yet. So when the neuron is in a state of rest, it has this resting membrane potential value, negative 70 millivolts. That basically means the inside of the cell is that much more negative than the outside of the cell. So the idea here is that when the neuron is at the resting membrane potential value, it's not doing anything. It's not firing off action potentials. It's not communicating with anybody. It's, it's doing nothing. It's basically like a person that's just sitting on the couch doing nothing. But when a neuron receives a stimulus, and this may manif this stimulus may manifest itself as, if this is a sensory neuron, it may be a change in pressure, a change in temperature, or for this motor neuron that we're looking at here, this motor neuron may be receiving a signal from a different neuron, and this signal is going to be a neurotransmitter. So when this neurotransmitter binds to receptor proteins that are on the cell body and dendrites of this neuron here, so here's your cell body right here, you can see the nucleus right there, here are the dendrites that project outward. So when this neurotransmitter activates these receptors here, that is going to cause the opening of ion channels in the membrane, and you're going to see ions like sodium and potassium start moving back and, back and forth. So if positively charged sodium and potassium are moving across the membrane, that's naturally going to change the distribution of electrical charge and the membrane potential is going to change. The idea is that if the membrane potential changes enough, this will cause the neuron to fire action potentials. These action potentials, like I said before, are going to act like an electrical current. It's basically a wave of ions moving down the length of the axon away from the cell body. And some components of the long axon that you can see here, a lot of axons in the body are covered by a fatty membranous insulation called the myelin sheath, which we will talk about here in just a little bit. And then you'll notice there are some gaps in between the myelin sheath called nodes of Ranvier. That will become more important when we actually study the nervous system in earnest. But once the action potential current reaches the end of the axon, which is called the axon terminal, that is going to trigger the release of another set of neurotransmitter, and that neurotransmitter will then stimulate whatever effector cell is over here. That may be another neuron that will carry on the message even further, or it may be an actual effector cell like a muscle or a glandular cell, in which case that neurotransmitter will elicit a physiological response. Okay, so like I said, we will talk a lot more about neurons when we actually start covering the nervous system. So as for glial cells, there are a lot of different types of glial cells, but the thing they all have in common is that they all serve some kind of support role. Another thing that we're going to eventually see is that the types of glial cells we see differ based on whether we're talking about the peripheral nervous system or the central nervous system. There are two major types of glial cells that you will find in the peripheral nervous system. First are called Schwann cells. Schwann cells actually deposit and make up the myelin sheath of neurons that are in the peripheral nervous system. So the myelin sheath that you saw in the previous slide, each layer of myelin in between nodes of Ranvier was actually a whole Schwann cell that wraps itself around the axon. And then next you have satellite cells, which we're not really going to talk about very much this semester, but they tend to provide support functions for peripheral nervous system ganglia, which are just basically big clusters, big groups of neuron cell bodies that you find outside the central nervous system. As for the glia of the central nervous system, first you have oligodendrocytes. They serve a very similar function to the Schwann cells. They make up the myelin sheath in the central nervous system. But one of the major differences here is that oligodendrocyte myelin gives off a characteristic white color. And this will become important in the future when we start making distinctions between white matter and gray matter in the central nervous system. Astrocytes serve a multitude of different functions, which include uh, providing neurons with nutrients, getting membrane transport processes to be facilitated, uh, 
uh, getting materials exchanged between the blood, the cerebrospinal fluid, and then the interstitial fluid around the nervous tissue. But one of the most important functions that we will talk about eventually is the maintenance of what is called the blood-brain barrier, which as the name suggests, is a membranous barrier that separates the blood from the nervous tissue. So the idea there is that nervous tissue is especially sensitive, so any noxious substances that might be in the blood, we do not want those substances to have access to the nervous tissue of the central nervous system. Ependymal cells separate nervous tissue from the cerebrospinal fluid. So ependymal cells basically serve kind of an epithelia-like function. Not only do they serve a function in generating cerebrospinal fluid, which basically is just filtered blood that then is extracted into separate cavities like the central canal of the spinal cord and the ventricles of the brain. So it helps the nervous tissue to get important nutrients like electrolytes and glucose and things like that since the blood-brain barrier usually restricts that very greatly. So ependymal cells you're going to find at the interface between cerebrospinal fluid and nervous tissue itself. And then microglia, which we're not going to talk about very much, they serve kind of an immune-like function that helps with stress response, especially since the immune system has very limited access to nervous tissue itself. So in this picture, you can see kind of an illustration on the left and then an actual histological section of nervous tissue on the right of central nervous system nervous tissue. You can see a neuron here surrounded by uh, its axon surrounded by the myelin that is laid down by an oligodendrocyte. You can see some microglia. You can see some astrocytes. So if you look at the actual histological section here, you're going to get the idea that the glial cells uh, outnumber the neurons qu by quite a bit, but because the neurons have such a specialized and unique anatomy to them, they're very easily identified. And in, and in some cases, you can even make out part of a neuron's axon. Okay, that's going to do it for this video. Here is a list of vocabulary terms you might want to be aware of. For checking your understanding, number one, what is meant by the term excitable when discussing not only neurons, but muscle cells as well? Number two, which parts of a neuron participate in the generation of an action potential? And number three, can a neuron receive signals, send signals, or can they do both? So that's going to do it. If you have any questions, go ahead and drop them in the comments section. I will see you next time.